Well, good evening and welcome to Cornerstone Presbyterian Church for our Good Friday service. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is in Him whom we have come to worship. We are here to know Christ and Him crucified. The night before, the disciples gathered with Jesus for the Passover meal. It was the final supper that the disciples would share with Jesus before His death. During the meal, a number of prophecies were given. A prophecy regarding one of the disciples would be Jesus' betrayal. And another disciple would deny him three times, even before the dawn. The disciples have escaped into the night along with Jesus. And Jesus is praying in preparation for the final hours before he goes to the cross. We have gathered in the spirit of that evening to reflect upon the meaningfulness of the cross of Jesus Christ. This is Good Friday. Thanks be to God. Please stand. had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised 
and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I am your creator, Lord of the universe. I have entrusted this world to you, but you are bent on destruction. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I made you in my image, but you have degraded body and spirit and marred the image of your God. You have deserted me and turned your backs on me. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I filled the earth with all that you need so that you might serve and care for one another as I have cared for you, but you have cared only to serve your own wealth and power. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I commanded you to love your neighbor as yourself, to love and forgive even your enemies. But you have made vengeance your rule and hate your guide. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. In the fullness of time, I sent you my son, that in him you might know me. 
and through him find life and peace, but you put him to death on the cross. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. Through the living Christ, I called you into my church to be my servants to this world, but you have grasped at privilege and forgotten my will. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I have given you a heavenly gift and a share in the Holy Spirit. I have given you the spiritual energies of the age to come, but you have turned away and crucified the Son of God afresh. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I have consecrated you in the truth. I have made you to be one in the unity of the Father and of the Son by the power of the Spirit, but you have divided my church and shrouded my truth. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. Turn again, my people. Listen to me. Let your bearing to one another arise out of your life in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself and in obedience accepted the death of the cross. But I have bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Turn again, my people. Listen to me. Consider, if you will, this night the reality 
of the agony Jesus faced on Good Friday. We've learned to anesthetize our bouts of agony. We strategize to avoid those occasions that are fraught with peril. Even if the best we can do is distract ourselves for a while, though we cannot avoid agony in this fallen world, that doesn't stop us from trying or seeking to buffer ourselves from agony or blunt its sharp edge. When we first begin to consider what agony Jesus may have endured, we begin to smuggle into our thinking and our notion that his agony was unlike ours because he had resources that we do not bring to the fight. That his divinity somehow lessened the agony. After all, didn't he know how temporary that agony would be? That three days of agony would fade into the brightness of the world to come. Jesus' agony was completely unlike ours. Not because he was fortified by his divine nature. Not because his agony had a shelf life of 72 hours. But because that which had been joyously united for all eternity past would be shattered. The Apostle Paul leads us in this path when he writes, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The church has often missed this, but Charles Spurgeon didn't. Christ was not a deified man, neither was he a humanized God. He was perfectly God, and at the same time, perfectly man. Luke records the words of the God-man spoken to his disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And on the brink of an even deeper agony and suffering, Jesus says, My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. As earnest was his desire, deeper was his agony. Jesus' suffering was filled with agony and anguish. One commentator notes, up to this point, Jesus seemed to have exerted the sternest self-control in order to mask his anguish. But now, in an enclosed field on the side of the Mount of Olives in a garden called Gethsemane, Jesus confessed to his disciples that his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow. If that's the reality, consider with me then the depth of that agony Jesus would endure. It's impossible to exaggerate the depth of Jesus' anguish in the garden. Matthew describes it like this, that taking with him Peter and the sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Those words, sorrowful and troubled, hardly do justice to the verbs recorded for us in Matthew, which suggest an anguish of wretchedness. He says, my soul is very sorrowful. Again, a weak translation of an uncommon word that we might render deeply grieved, an echo of the Greek translation of Psalms 42 and 43, that refrain, why are you cast down, O my soul? That's beginning to probe the depth of the agony of Jesus. Even unto death, he describes. Not so sorrowful that he wished he were dead, but that his sorrow was so deep it was almost killing him. Luke exposes the depth of that agony when he reports, even after there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthened him, he remained in agony and prayed more earnestly. 
Alexander White, the famous 19th century Scottish preacher, said that once he had seen the Lord Jesus in glory, he would next want to meet that angel who came to strengthen him in Gethsemane. For this angel was the only witness on earth of the moment when our Savior contemplated the agony he would endure for our sakes. So what are the causes of this agony? As awful as it was, it was not the physical agony that awaited him on the cross that terrified him. His more, was more than the experience of suffering and death, such as awaited those who would be crucified with him. Jesus' agony was brought on by three profound realities. Jesus dreads identification with sin, unlike those of us born into sin. Jesus dreads the wrath of God, which he would absorb on our behalf, unfiltered, undiminished, and unrestrained wrath. But it was more than that. Jesus dreads abandonment by the Father. A full, undiminished abandonment we have never known. And thanks to him, never will. Jesus was facing more than death or sadness. He was facing God-forsakenness. This is Good Friday. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me.
Our second scripture reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 22. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Please stand. If you've ever tried to hold the North Pole of a large magnet to the North Pole of another large magnet, you've felt in your hands the incredible force of repulsion that they each have for the other. A magnetic North Pole is attracted to its opposite, a South Pole, but it pushes back against another North Pole. You can't force them together, and the closer that they get to each other, the harder they repel away from each other. They don't go together and they can't stay together in the same space. Now imagine the incredible force of repulsion and recoil that you would generate if you tried to put two magnets the size of a house together at their North Poles. The force of repulsion and recoil would be immense. You couldn't get those two magnets in the same zip code together. But let's get bigger. What about two magnets the size of planet Earth brought together? Or let's get even bigger. What about two magnets the size of the Milky Way galaxy together at their North Poles? Or as big as we can possibly get, two magnets the size of the whole known universe together coming together at their North Poles? 
the recoil is unimaginable. But even the force of that repulsion and recoil pales in comparison to the recoil and the repulsion that Jesus experienced in his body and in his heart and soul as his father began to extend to him that cup in Gethsemane. Jesus is speaking out of the depths of untold and unimaginable repulsion and recoil when he begs in the garden, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Is this a moment of weakness? Is it a moment of doubt? As the Son of God trembles under the shadow of this cup, is he asking to abort the mission of redemption that he himself set in motion in eternity past? No. No, what we see here is not a moment of weakness, but a window into the heart of the spotless Lamb of God. He recoils not because he's doubting, but because he's perfect. And because that cup contains all of our imperfections. He recoils not because he's indecisive, but because he's clean and beautiful. And that cup contains all of our filth. He recoils not because he's ready to walk away and quit, but because that cup contains the wrath that we deserve for all the times that we have. This is light recoiling from darkness. This is holiness recoiling from sin. This is beauty recoiling from ugliness. This is blessing recoiling from damnation. This is life recoiling from death. This is heaven itself recoiling from hell itself. And there is no greater force, force of, of recoil and repulsion in all of this universe greater than the force of heaven pushing back against hell. They are perfectly, infinitely opposed to each other. They cannot share the same space. There is no greater repulsion, no stronger animosity, nothing more opposite and opposed than heaven against hell. Except for one thing. And if this is true, if there is one thing greater than even this, then it must be the strongest force in all of the universe, stronger than anything that ever was and is and ever will be. What is it? What force of repulsion could possibly be stronger than the repulsion of the perfect Lamb of God recoiling against the cup of God's wrath? What could possibly be stronger than the force of heaven recoiling against hell itself? On Good Friday, we're reminded that there was one thing that made the heart of the Son of God recoil even more than hell itself, and that was the prospect of his people going there. The love of God is stronger even than the recoil of heaven against hell because the love of God brought together heaven and hell together on the cross as the Lamb of God drank the cup of the wrath of God down to its dregs so that you would never have to. This is Good Friday. Thanks be to God. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once. Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not 
not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though they had many false witnesses came forward. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. You have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes. He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your judgment? He deserves, he deserves death. death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, to us, Christ. Who is it that struck you? Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you 
to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king will be your Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbathar. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king. Take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Please stand. may be seated. Theologians like to call it subtraction by addition. That's when the Son of Man, whom we know as Jesus Christ, the incarnate, added to himself a human nature. When he did that, he restricted himself. Being formed in the likeness of men, therefore experiencing the limitations of men. It's that mystery that Paul is speaking of in Philippians chapter 2, 
when he says, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Over the years, some have assumed that the Son of God must have emptied himself of some aspect of divinity, that in becoming man, he somehow shed himself of equality with God and was thus no more a man any more than you or me are a man. Others have argued that Christ retained his essential attributes, things like holiness and love, but he dropped things like omniscience and omnipotence. He did away with things like omnipresence and immunability. But if this is true, then Jesus is certainly more than a man, but he is less than God. And pondering these great mysteries, historic Christianity has avoided both of these errors and taught something else entirely. No, the question in Philippians 2 is not of what did the Son of God empty himself, but instead into what did the Son of Man empty himself. Paul is telling us that God has poured himself into the fullness of man. That God became man in every way, yet without sin. That he became the God-man and took to himself a human nature and became a perfect servant. This is the Son of God experienced a subtraction when he added to himself a human nature. The King James says it well when it says that he became as nothing. The prince turned into a pauper, a king who became servant, the one in whom all of us owe submission in service became the one who submitted to the will of his father and became a servant to us to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, in the end, the Son of Man wasn't crucified because of Judas Iscariot and his betrayal. He wasn't crucified because the Pharisees and the Sadducees had it in for him. He wasn't crucified because misguided officials like Pilate and Caiaphas didn't have the courage to stand up for what was right. He wasn't even crucified because we, the crowd, cried, crucify him, crucify him. No, he was crucified because he loved us. Because God had marked him out with infinite and effectual love to draw us to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, a love so great that he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But that he poured himself into the form of a servant and became nothing so that we might become something, his treasured possession. This is Good Friday. Thanks be to God.
So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home.
Please stand. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lip. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned, yet death reigned from Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation of all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous.
After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths and with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. 